Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everyone welcome back to another episode of the Islamic Calling podcast we missed you so i'm back with another episode yeah! So recently, I just watched a video by Apostate Aladdin. Today, I want to point out how the concept of a kafir in Islam undermines the validity of the entire religion. <laughs> Apostle Aladdin is an ex-Muslim. He criticizes Islam and he made a whole career out of it. The boy ain't right. Let's take a look at what he says regarding the Quran and I'll make my response. Hello everyone, my name is Apostle Aladdin. I make videos talking about my journey out of Islam and other related topics. Today I want to point out how the concept of a kafir in Islam is not only absurd and oxymoronic, but it undermines the validity of the entire religion. Up, 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 up. I'm not saying that this disproves Islam, because Islam was never proven true to begin with, but it definitely doesn't help make it seem any more credible. In Islam, a kafir is a disbeliever, yes, but do you know the etymology of the word? The word kafir in Arabic means someone who commits kufr, and the word kufr means covering up. In the context of this religion, it means the denial or hatred of the truth and covering it up. In other words, a kafir is someone who knows the truth of Islam but denies it anyway. Not because they're not convinced, but because of other reasons, like arrogance or hatred or loving sin. And this isn't my personal interpretation, it's all from Islamic sources. Some Muslims really think that someone would have extramarital sex and drink wine for 70 years, then get tortured eternally, instead of doing all that in heaven. No sane person would make that trade. At the end of the video, he says that why? why would anyone choose to become a disbeliever, right? Why do people choose to commit murder? I mean, like, they know that they're gonna go to jail or they could go to jail, right? So why do they commit murder, right? Clearly, uh, this is unfair to murderers. Uh, what if a murderer is like uh, intellectually convinced that, you know, murdering is right, right? Like, this is such a dumb point. By the way, before anyone strumming me, no, I'm not saying murder and disbelief is the same. I'm not comparing the two. However, the point is, usually a person is punished despite their intellectual conviction. A judge will punish a mass murderer despite his convictions. It doesn't matter if a mass murderer think it was okay to murder people. It's irrelevant to his punishment for violating the law. Same thing here. In Islam, we have a concept of something called the fitra, right? And the fitra is basically a innate knowledge that was given to human beings by Allah SWT. What happens, and he co completely ignores this by the way, he never mentions this. What happens is that this fitra, which is metaphysical, it's not like some kind of physical thing. This knowledge is something that everyone has and people either choose to accept their fitra, this intuitive knowledge, or they reject it or they cover it up with like falsehood. And that's essentially what a kafir is, is someone who hides the this knowledge or this feeling and this intuition that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, you know, Islam is true. A kafir isn't uh, someone who re uh, looks at all these different religion and sees that Islam doesn't make sense, therefore rejects it. No, a kafir from an Islamic point of view is someone who has this fitra, but they have covered up their fitra with uh, falsehood and uh, misrepresentation. Now he then goes on to say that oh, well, no one, no one would do that, right? I mean, who would want to go to jail, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's such a dumb point. It doesn't matter. People are stupid, okay? People are arrogant, like they don't care. They go by their emotions. The people are retarded. And sometimes the people's emotion and rationality get, can get confused, right? Sometimes you may think you're ma making a rational decision, when in reality you're not making a rational decision. The word mushrik means someone who commits shirk, and shirk means worshipping anything aside from Allah. It's the unforgivable sin. And Nawawi explains that shirk could involve worshipping idols and other creatures while admitting in Allah's existence, as the kuffar of Quraysh allegedly did. So kufr is more general than shirk. And Bin Baz explains that shirk includes those who ask for help from the dead, or jinn, or idols, or stars, and so on, or those who make animal sacrifices for them. When you stop working backwards from the conclusion that the Qur'an is perfect, you start to see a constellation of imperfections. In this case, note the extremely imprecise use of words. The Qur'an uses shirk and kufr interchangeably when they are two vastly different concepts. There are kuffar, meaning disbelievers, who aren't polytheists or idolaters. And most mushrikeen, meaning idolaters or polytheists, most mushrikeen in the world don't acknowledge Allah's existence at all. So the Qur'an's generalizations are factually incorrect. It is painfully obvious to a non-Muslim that the author of the Qur'an was operating with a very limited view of the world. Which I am too smart! I am too smart! I am too smart! I am too smart! 
Este Marty. So here is committing the straw man argument fallacy. The Quran never claimed that the mushrik and the kafir means the same thing. The Quran never claimed that. Stop it. It's a complete straw man. The Quran never said a mushrik and a kafir is exa exactly the same thing. Why does it say that? The reason Quran often uses the word mushrik and the word kufar or the kafir sometimes interchangeably, it's because the Quran describes something that they have in common, which is disbelief. They both constitute disbelief. For example, if you choose to worship another deity besides Allah SWT, you disbelieve in Allah SWT because Allah SWT clearly makes it clear that he's the only one worthy of worship. Same way, if you disbelieve in Allah SWT, you also commit an act of disbelief, right? So it's the same thing. <laughs> it's kind of the same action. That's why it's often uh, uses the term interchangeably. This doesn't mean that Allah SWT doesn't know the difference between the two words. There's a lot more I could say about shirk, but going back to the topic of this video, the essence of kufr is denial. Not honest disagreement, not being unconvinced, but denial. So a kafir is a believing disbeliever, which is an oxymoron, meaning a self-contradicting word. We're supposed to believe that many sane human beings know Allah is real, know Islam is true, but choose to deny it all anyway. He's competing the faulty comparison files. So basically he's uh, comparing the conscious mind with the fitra, which is something that is metaphysical, something that is innate. So these two things are not the same. If they were the same, then your arguments would make sense to say that this is an oxymoron to say a kafir is a believing disbeliever, but it's not. One is the fitra, which is something metaphysical, something innate, and you choosing to either accept Islam or not is happening on your rational mind, something that you can control. So these two things are not the same. So when the Quran is describing you as a kafir, meaning someone who has this innate knowledge, but it's being covered up and re being rejected by you, that's not an oxymoron. Belief is not a choice. A few moments later. At the end of the day, the question of the existence of God or gods or a specific religion are to a large extent philosophical disagreements. People can and do disagree all the time while being intellectually honest. He is contradicting himself. Blood at one point says belief is not a choice. Then he says people can disagree while being intellectually honest. But how can you disagree and be intellectually honest if belief is not a choice? So which one is it? Is belief a choice or not? I'm afraid, mademoiselle, that you are a walking contradiction. Philosophers and laymen can argue in good faith about the existence of God or about the meaning of life or how to find morality. We don't see different philosophical views as manifestations of evil with only one being good. So why do we do that with religion? And so basically he's saying that Oh, you know, the disagreement between believer and disbeliever is just an intellectual disagreement. Right? Then why, why is it such a big deal? Yeah, I mean like a, a debate between a, a, a liberal and a Nazi is also an intellectual disagreement. So what's the big deal? You know, why couldn't people, why couldn't people just leave Adolf Hitler be? Nein, 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 nein. You know? <laughs> see, the, the difference that he's not seeing is that the problem, you see, when you disbelieve in Islam, it causes a lot of problems. First, it causes a problem for you because you're choosing to reject someone who created, someone who's keeping you alive. That is morally wrong. And secondly, your denial will lead you to the hellfire, it will lead to a bad consequences. On top of it, it will leave bad consequences in the society. So this disbelief isn't simply some disagreements about whether you like chocolate or not. This disagreement is a serious one, which can have serious consequences for you and for others. So painting it as uh, like some kind of just normal disagreement is false. It's just intellectually dishonest. Let me clarify what I mean with an analogy. Say I'm having a debate with someone about the taxes in our state. I say that taxes are good because they fund social services and education and infrastructure, which raises the standard of living and so on. And I think that there is inefficiency and corruption that need to be addressed so that we get our money's worth. The other person argues that taxes should be reduced because we can never fully trust the government to efficiently and honestly use our hard earned wages. So we're better off having more money in our pockets and using private companies to get the same services. We can both genuinely want what's best for ourselves and the other residents of the state, but we're convinced about different ways of getting there. We can point to case studies and examples of other states to support our respective opinions, but at the end of the day, we cannot be sure of what the future holds in this specific circumstance when we follow either approach. If I had a time machine and I could observe two timelines, one where we tried my approach and one where we tried theirs, I could know with hindsight and certainty which of us was correct. 
So let's say I use the time machine and I found out that I was correct. Does that mean that they are a bad person or that they must have known that they are wrong, but they took that position out of greed? Granted, it may be the case that some people who want lower taxes are greedy and selfish little wealth hoarders, but I wouldn't be justified to rant and rave about how anyone who supports lower taxes is greedy, terrible, truth-denying scum of the earth. Can I claim that all libertarians are knowingly evil? That's essentially what Allah does in the Quran. Here he commits the false analogy fallacy. The analogy doesn't work because you don't know what's in the heart of the libertarian. However, Allah Almighty does know what's in the heart of disbelievers. That's because he is all knowledgeable. He also knows that no matter how many chances or signs he gave to people of the hellfire, they will never change. This is why Allah says in Quran chapter 2 verse 6 indeed, those who disbelieve it is all the same for them whether you warn them or do not warn them, they will not believe. And the thing is, is that Allah SWT won't just send you to the hellfire. Like he will put you on trial. Evidence that will be put forward in front of you. And even you yourself would not be able to argue against them on that day. So this idea that, you know, it will be completely unjust. It's not unjust because there will, there will literally be a trial for you. These holy verses can override someone's empathy and morality and convince them that disbelievers not only deserve eternal torture, but that believers will be sitting on couches watching and laughing as it happens. If God said it, then it must be good and we must enjoy the idea of our enemies burning. What do we learn from this? We learn that Islam is based. I see this sort of comment all the time. Believers gloating that they cannot wait for the day of judgment so I will get what I deserve, while they laugh in heaven. To bring it back to my tax debate analogy, that's like me wishing that the other person loses all their money and becomes homeless with no social services because they refuse to fund them, while I watch and laugh from my living room couch. How petty and sadistic is that? Again, I'm not saying that most Muslims think this way, but that's the way the author of the Quran thinks. So I'm not surprised when I see it echoed among believers. He completely lies and misrepresents Islam. Like if you look at the verse he quoted in 8334, it says, This day it is those who believe who have the laugh of disbelievers on high couches gaze. What does that mean? So basically, if you read Ibn Kathir's Tafsir, this is referring to people or disbelievers who would mock believers. For example, it says the following, Allah informs that the criminals used to laugh at the believers in the worldly life. In other words, they would mock them and despise them. Whenever they would pass the believers, they would wink at each other about them, meaning in contempt about them, of them. So this is the kind of disbelievers that the Quran is describing. It's not describing you who don't make fun of uh, Muslims, although you do make fun of Muslims by making fun of a religion. This is the kind of people that they're talking about. These are the people who are constantly bullying Muslims, who are mocking Muslims. And yeah, these people deserve to be in hell. And when they do, we'll laugh. You know what? I'm proud, proud of that. that. Besides, you can be a terrible human being, say a mass murderer. But as long as you die a Muslim, you have a chance at escaping hell after paying for your sins. While my sweet old neighbor Deborah, who makes me cookies, is tortured forever. Does that sound fair to you? Yeah, because your sweet old neighbor, Deborah, is denying someone who created her. Even the evidences have been made clear to her. Uh, she's denying her intuitions and she's denying someone who made her grow up, gave her everything she needed for her life. And, uh, and yeah, and that's wrong. That's morally evil, actually. Denying the right of your creator. That is the most evil thing you can do. The, and then he quotes this hadith of, of this murderer who becomes a Muslim and Allah SWT forgiving them. The reason this person is better than Deborah is because this person actually repented. He actually realized his mistake and he became a Muslim. And when you become a Muslim, it, it becomes a form of repentance because you can never go back to your life of murdering and stealing and all these other kind of evil things that he used to do. Okay. It's the same with Umar bin Khattab, right? Before, he was a very evil person. But after he became Muslim, that was gone. Because he had to live by the Sharia. He can no longer murder, steal, or, or do all these other kind of evil things. Meaning, this is a form of repentance. Like, he can, he's becoming Muslim, and by becoming Muslim, he's taking a pledge that he will never do this again. Okay? However, when it comes to your, uh, your sweet uh, neighbor, Deborah, who's you know, giving you food and whatnot, She's rejecting 
the person who gave her the ability to make foods. Fatwa are people of the period, meaning people who lived during a period of time in between prophets. This classification may also apply to people who have not received the message of Islam at all, even after the last prophet, Muhammad. Scholars disagree on what their fate is. Some think that they're destined for hell, some think that they'll be judged based on their deeds instead of their beliefs, while others think that they will be tested after their death. One narration says that Allah will order them to walk into hell. If they obey, they are saved. If they refuse and disobey, they'll be tortured eternally. So Allah plays messed up mental games with them like some sort of thriller movie villain. And maybe it's just me, but if I'm awoken from death by an angel or God, and I'm asked if I believe in this plot, I can't imagine saying anything but yes. Yeah, Ahlul Fatra. So Ahlul Fatra are basically people who will be tested on the day of resurrection once again. Like Allah is literally giving them another chance. Why is that wrong? So like, would you prefer that he sends them to heaven without like testing them? The purpose of doing this test is, is that if he sends people to paradise for simply being human beings, that is unjust. That is unjust because they, didn't, they don't deserve to be there. They didn't do anything, right? It's about merit. <laughs> right it's about merit and that's what it is like it's, it's it's meritocracy right like for example if you are actually a good person you will be in paradise perfectly balanced as all things should be saying that oh you know Allah some other should just send them to the paradise uh, without any 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 conditions that's like nepotism imagine like you have a child like you give that child everything that you can even though he does he didn't do anything to deserve it right? if you like the video don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to support this channel then please become a patreon or a youtube member and yeah inshallah i'll see you guys next time